Once Queen Elizabeth was asked about what, what her ideology was, and her answer was, we are older than capitalism and socialism. And it's true, because what she represents is feudalism. This is a feudal or neo-feudal degenerate uh, that, uh, that heads up this family. Now, she's not an absolute monarch. This is an oligarchical monarchy. But the power of the monarch within the oligarchy is, is very considerable. Maybe we just give, give some examples. I think if you wanted to look at this, do a short summary. You could organize it around themes like insanity, in other words, mental degeneracy, which they have very, very heavily, and then support for genocide. Um, it says, Dieu est mon droit, and it, that Dieu est mon droit means incest is fine as long as you keep it in the family. Uh, George III was stark raving mad, the tyrant. Queen Victoria, uh, for the last 40 years of her life, was a recluse who ran a death cult around her dead husband, Prince Albert, and she had seers, occultists, apparitionists, Ouija boards. George III was stark raving mad. There was even a movie about that some years ago. Victoria spent 40 years of her life as a recluse, practically never going outside. She lived in Balmoral Castle. Some years ago, the prescription records of the local pharmacy were found. She was an opium addict in the form of laudanum, which was a tincture, a solution of opium in, in, uh, in alcohol that they would, they would use. And she was known as Mrs. John Brown because she spent all of her time with this Scottish, um, well, rustic, right, who lived there. And um, he basically had the adjoining bedroom. So that was Mrs. John, John Brown. Um, other examples would be, uh, you look at uh, Prince Philip, right? He wants to come back reincarnated as a deadly virus to kill people and solve the problem of overpopulation in the world. I mean, that's, that statement goes beyond anything Hitler ever said in public, right? That you want to kill people for the, for the purpose of lowering the population. Prince Charles, right? What's with him? He says he talks to plants. All right, fine, anybody can talk to plants. But then he added, and they answer me. <laughs> So when the plants start answering you, then you know that you're you're pretty much in uh, in trouble. Uh, Prince Albert Victor Edward, known as Prince Eddie, and according to most historians, he is the main suspect of being Jack the Ripper. And not that he was necessarily insane to start with; he probably died of syphilis. Um, okay, um, but m m apart from this, now the the, um, the 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 insanity is one thing, but then. This, this affinity for Nazism and the affinity for, for genocide. Now, the, the key guy, of course, is King Edward VIII, who was a close personal friend of Hitler. This is about 1936, right? He was forced out. He was a volunteer to Hitler to become the viceroy of a Nazi puppet state in Great Britain. If Hitler had conquered the British Isles, he would have been the Marshal Pitain, except he would have said, I'm a member of the royal family. And when you think about it, that would have meant that Nazism would have come into Canada and into Australia and into New Zealand. Hitler would have gotten a foothold in the North American continent. It would have been a very grave thing. But it, it would have it meant that a lot of institutions in the empire, a lot of United Empire loyalists would have immediately said, well, if the king is Edward and he's supporting Hitler, then we have to support Hitler too. If you wanted to focus on one person in the entire thousand-year history of the British monarchy, right, going back to William the Conqueror in 1066, it would probably be King Edward VII. Now, he was king, formally speaking, pretty much in the first decade of the, of the, of the 20th century. So about 100 years ago, he died. So he'd been in power from about 1900 to 1909 or 1910. However, since Victoria had been this recluse for 40 years, he was, in effect, the acting king. And this is the one case where the monarch coincides with the leader of the oligarchy. In other words, he combined both posts. Sometimes you'll have the monarch as some weak figure, and the oligarchy has a different leader. But King Edward VII has got both of these. Not exactly a tyrannous. Again, it's an oligarchical system. It's not a French style, you know, Louis XIV absolute monarchy or something like this. It's a doge, right? He's like a doge, but of Venice, but he's, if he can lead the oligarchy. And what he did, this is the person who basically organized most of the historical tragedies from about 1860 until, until his death. And World War I is really his handiwork. Uh, Edward VII is the guy who created the Triple Entente. In other words, Britain, 
France and Russia against Germany. And this is a, this this can teach us a lot about our current period because the the US China relationship today is a is a kind of an echo of the British German relationship uh, at the time and of course that le that led to a world war. So he set up this alliance system, right? This idea that in in 1914 when something happened in Europe, the only thing that was possible was if France started to mobilize, then everybody else had to mobilize. And once everybody started to mobilize, then war was a foregone conclusion. So Edward VII is, is somebody who set that up. He made a trip to uh, North America, the first uh, visit by um, um, at least the Prince of Wales to North America in 1860. It's thought that he helped get the American Civil War going. He did uh, a number of, of things like this. So Edward VII, you'd have to say, is the indispensable person for causing World War I. Out of World War I comes World War II pretty much directly, Nazism, Communism, eventually the Cold War. The entire pattern of world history since Edward VII has been shaped as a tragedy, right, as a catastrophe. He's, he's, he is considered their greatest activist, right? In other words, their, their most successful political guy since William the Conqueror would be, would be Edward VII. All right, we, we mentioned Edward VIII as a, uh, as a Nazi, and this he clearly was. Of course, not just him. There was a whole faction in the House of Lords, the so-called Cliftonstadt. It's written Cliveden, but Cliftonstadt. Uh, this is Lady Astor, Lord Astor, a whole group of dukes and lords and others who were all pro-Hitler. And this is the group that supported uh, Chamberlain, right? The appeasement, so-called appeasement policy, which was really just the support of Hitler. And did they learn anything from this stuff, right? A after 1945, you could say, well, you know, they were fooled by Hitler, many were fooled by Hitler. Edward VII, if anybody is the architect of the catastrophe of the 20th century, Edward VII is, is right up there. He's at least a real, a real contender. What, what is the name of this family? Who are they, right, this royal family? Today they call themselves Windsor. They decided to call themselves Windsor in about 1916, 1917, when all of those millions of British getting killed in the First World War that Edward VII had set up, there was a huge anti-German hysteria in, in Britain. Up until that time, they'd been calling themselves the ruling house of Hanover. And they'd been going by that name since George I had come over, right, around 1710. But the real name of it is Saxe Coburg Gotha, or Sachsen Coburg Gotha, or Guelph. <laughs> Guelph being the anglicized version of Welf, W-E-L-F, Die Welfen. That is what the House of Hanover used to call themselves. So this is the family that now call themselves, uh, call themselves Windsor. Prince Philip of, of uh, again, a Greek-Danish branch of this family is the guy who wants to come back uh, as a virus. But the question was, after 1945, did they learn that Nazism was bad? Well, who was Prince Philip's best friend? His best friend was Prince, Prince Bernard of Holland. In the case of, uh, of Philip, his best friend, lifelong friend, was Prince Bernard of Holland. And that, of course, is the founder of the Bilderberger Group. In a way, you could say the Bilderberger Group, the royal patrons of that Bilderberger ph phenomenon, were Prince Philip and, and R, Prince Philip still, and, and now the late Prince Bernard. What's with Prince Bernard? He was a minor, not very wealthy German nobleman, not even a prince. I think he was... Uh, the uh, the ruler, maybe the duke or the count of um, Detmold Lippe, Lippe for sure. And he married the House of Orange, which is either they're the richest in the world or the Windsors. It's between Orange and Windsor. All right. Uh, Bernard had been, when he had been in the university in Berlin in um, the late 1920s, he had joined the Nazi stormtroopers. He was a brown shirt. He was a member of the SA, the Sturmabteilung. He went from the S.A. brown shirt stormtroopers to the S.S. black shirt elite. And he was a member of the Reiter S.S. In other words, the part, you know, there was a certain, there was a subdivision of the S.S., the elite of the elite, la creme de la creme, where in order to get into that one, you had to be a noble. So he was a, he was a key figure in that. Then when he married uh, Princess uh, uh, of Orange there, the, the, the future queen, then uh, Juliana, I guess it was, he had, to, he had to basically resign from all of his Nazi party <laughs> offices. So Prince Philip never learned 
not to, to not to be friendly with Nazis. He was a friend of Prince Bernard all his life. It just never ended. Now, uh, the question of Lady Diana about 12 years ago, right, Princess Diana, Lady Diana Spencer, Princess Diana, she had married Charles, of course, and Charles was an adulterer. He had Camilla Parker Bowles on the side. Uh, it's typical of the family. His brother, his younger brother, Prince Andrew, known as Randy Andy, was also a rake. But uh, Lady Di uh, Princess Diana, after having divorced Prince Charles, right, since this, her life with him was unbearable, she was going to marry Dodi Fayed. Now, Dodi Fayed, of course, this is the son of Al Fayed, who had bought this Harrods department store in London, except for about 10 or 15 years, there was a huge feud between Al Fayed, I guess of Egypt, and Tiny Rowland. And Tiny Rowland was a, a guy who worked with and for the British royal family. So there had been a kind of a conflict between Al Fayed and, and, the, uh, and the royal family through, through Tiny Rowland. At the point that Princess Diana was going to marry Dodi Fayed, she was going to convert to Islam. So you would have had a situation, including today, if this had if gone otherwise, if she had lived, you would have had the Queen Mother of England, or Queen of England, depending. At, well, of course, by the time she converted, she wouldn't have been Queen. But the Queen Mother, for sure, she would have remained would have been a Muslim. And this would have happened about 1999, 2000, just in time for 9-11. We would have had the whole clash of civilization strategy completely negated because the Queen Mother of England is a Muslim. So this, this was unacceptable. Queen Elizabeth, um, she, first of all, she is fabulously wealthy. I mean, she doesn't appear on these lists when you see something that says, you know, Warren Buffett or... Uh, she has a large fortune which does not appear because it is held through this... Uh, I think it's called Couts, C-O-U-T-S, is the bank that, that handles her personal finances. Anyway, there are trusts and other things that you don't see that she owns, right? It's rumored that she owns a good part of the real estate in Manhattan, right? That would already make her fabulously wealthy. She can dissolve Parliament any time she wants. She can just send them all home. Uh, she can. She has to appoint the person who tries to become Prime Minister. You want to try to form a government, you have to go through her. Um, well, let's go through the Governors General. I think the, the two, I think the most eloquent examples that I could cite were, in 1975, you had this guy, Gal Whitlam, in Australia, who was trying to set up an alternative energy supply for Australia. He was trying to make direct oil for technology deals with Middle East oil producers, a very good thing to do. And uh, he was then uh, ousted, and it was ousted by the actions of the royal governor general, because there was a conflict between two branches of parliament. And a very good example is under Mulroney, so-called Malrené among the Quebecois. Mulroney was the guy who brought you free trade, right? The giant sucking sound uh, in the form of NAFTA. Uh, there was a uh, large opposition in the Canadian Senate. There was no majority for this NAFTA monstrosity. So the Queen obliged Mulroney by appointing new senators, packing the Canadian Senate, so that there would be a majority for this uh, free trade treaty, which I think everybody, including Canada, has, has suffered under. So the power of these governor generals is uh, is extensive. Uh, she gets these red boxes. Um, all the top secret documents from the SIS, from MI5, MI6, the whole British intelligence establishment, right, the Treasury, she gets these red boxes and she, she reads them. And uh, the entire bureaucracy serves her, the, the, the entire loyalty. Right? All the, the officers in the army are monarchists and royalists. Uh, I, I think you would have to conclude that, that Great Britain is a, is a police state far beyond anything that, that we've seen here in the United States. Um, with these closed circuit TV cameras um, uh, everywhere, they, this this uh, Windsor dynasty or dynasty, have, they have pre presided over the creation of a of a police state. Um, the, the, the social mobility, in other words, your chances if you're if you're born in the bottom twenty percent economically, your chances of getting to the top five percent uh, right now in the United States are worse than any country in continental Europe, but. The British society is, is even more hierarchical, more stratified, 
and with less mobility that we have, the, the beef against the monarchy, actually, that I try to represent anyway, is, is a strain of thought within England, within Britain. Uh, my grandfather was from Wakefield. He was a bricklayer, skilled worker. My grandmother was from Leeds. Okay, so this is the north of England. This is Yorkshire. And in Yorkshire, there is a tradition, which is you don't like the court. You don't like Buckingham Palace. You don't like the city of London. You don't like the foreign office. You're suspicious of this entire imperial complex. This is a strain of thought inside inside Britain. So it's not that I'm saying British are bad. I'm saying this is this is a view that is also well represented inside England. Anyway, it, it's a it's a well established tradition that the north of England, right, the Yorkshire School, is extremely uh, hostile, skeptical against a lot of these manifestations and I hope there are still some people who keep that going as I tried to but the Rothschilds are are one of the banking houses I mean if you if you go back to uh, to King Edward the seventh he had a group of bankers around him and, and they significant and were also Jewish bankers it, it, one of one of the things that that Edward the seventh said to the to the Jewish banking community in London is if you want to be admitted into society it, it, Edward the seventh's problem was he didn't have any money and he wanted to live on a, on a vast scale. So he said to these bankers, if I give you my investments, his investments were not a lot, I want all the profits to belong to me. I expect you to deliver profits. But he's the Prince of Wales, and he's really the king, um, out of Marlborough House in that case. So he said to them, if there are profits, I get the profits, and you, you jack up the profits. If there are losses, you eat the losses. And this is uh, Sir Ernest Castle. Uh, Rothschild is another example, although they had they had established themselves some, somewhat earlier. Uh, August Belmont, the, the guy who ran the Democratic Party from 1850 to, I don't know, 1870, 1880, the whole New York establishment dominated by August Belmont. August Belmont was officially the Rothschild agent in, in North America. This is under Edward VII, and he, here's the problem that they have. In 1899, you have the Boer War. And what the Boer War shows, first of all, is that the British are militarily very weak because the, the Afrikaners in, in Orange Free State and Transvaal defeat the British imperial forces. They, they then essentially reveal the weakness of the British. And at that point, Russia, under Count Witte, proposes to France and to Germany, let's form a continental bloc against the British. Let's line up Europe against the British. Uh, and unfortunately, it didn't work. It didn't work because the German emperor, Kaiser Wilhelm, Emperor William II, the Kaiser, was so stupid and was so much of an Anglophile and was so incapable of making strategic decisions that he did not accept this golden opportunity to really prevent World War I by having a continental bloc, Russia, Germany, France, of peaceful economic development and freeze the British out. And therefore, the, the shock that that sent... The 1899-1900-1901 isolation of the British is what then gave the impulse to Milner and Cecil Rhodes and, and people like this to come up with these round tables to begin a whole new strategy. And that's what then leads, uh, with King Edward leading the charge, to the Triple Entente, the Anglo, the, the British-French Entente of 1903, and then the really big one is the British Russian one of 1907-1908, which was considered impossible because the, 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 the big conflict had been between Russia and, uh, and, and the English. But Edward VII was, was able to paper over all this stuff, and then shortly after he died, that exploded into World War I. One of the puppets of Edward VII was Theodore Roosevelt. And Theodore Roosevelt was a guy who had, you know, had this identity crisis going, and he wanted to solve this by asserting that he was a member of the Anglo-Saxon master race. So Edward VII would, would write him letters saying, Dear President Roosevelt, you and I are the leaders of the two branches of the Anglo-Saxon race. I represent the monarchical one, and you represent the democratic one, but we have to work together. And uh, Theodore Roosevelt would go gaga, right? He would say, oh, my God. The king is treating me like an equal. I've got to do what he says, right? So this essentially, the U.S.-British special relationship, if you like. Now, Winston Churchill, where does he come in? Uh, Randolph Churchill uh, is, is his, uh, his, his father. He married this woman, Jenny Jerome. Jenny Jerome came from, the fam from the, the, basically the New York uh, banking community. 
dominated by August Belmont and, and others. So uh, Randolph Churchill died of syphilis, <laughs> like, uh, like uh, Prince uh, Eddie, uh, was, quite, was quite common. The um, Churchill family, though, is the, the career of Randolph Churchill was, spo- was sponsored by Edward VII and Sir Winston Churchill, Winston Churchill, one of the things, one of his first jobs was that he would write a letter to King Edward VII every day telling him what had gone on in Parliament that day. So he was also a protege. So the guys who bring you the c- catastrophes of the 20th century uh, are, in many cases, protégés of, of Edward VII. The British East India Company has two guys that essentially define economics today. One is David Ricardo. He's the head of the British East India Company, practically, and he's the, he's the source of monetarism, right, of, of Milton Friedman, Chicago School, stuff like this. However, they also have a, they have a training academy for their executives. It's called ha- Halliburry. And here we have Malthus, Thomas Malthus. He, he copies things from Venetians. He copies from a guy called Ortes of Venice. But this whole idea that there are too many people, that science and technology can't make a difference. This is, this is copied from Ortes. This is copied from Gian Maria Ortes. Malthus was the big ideologue of the British East India Company, and they ran genocide in India. In other words, you talk about genocide, uh, you know, they, they did it in India on a vast scale. So Malthus is this idea. World is overpopulated. Science and technology can do nothing. Progress is impossible. It'll always be the same, right? There's no way out of it. That leads to Darwin. That's essentially Darwin's worldview, which is uh, scientifically false. Nietzsche and uh, ultimately Hitler and the Nazis. And again, Prince Philip. If Prince Philip says he wants to be reincarnated as a deadly virus to come back and kill people and help solve the problem of overpopulation. Again, that statement goes beyond anything Hitler ever said. The the answer to that uh, that I would give is the one of of Leibniz and and essentially of of, of optimism, which is, is simply that science and technology have repeatedly shown. Jean Maria Ortes said that the absolute upper limit of the carrying capacity of the world is three billion, and he said this about 1790 in uh, in an essay on population, and Malthus simply took that. So. Uh, the, the the Malthusian argument is that the, the population outpaces food production. It's the opposite. Food production outpaces population as long as you simply allow science and technology to be to be supported. Uh, people are wealth. It was their, their whole approach is is scientifically wrong, economically wrong. People are wealth, as uh, as uh, Spanish. Uh, the Spanish tradition is gobernar es poblar. To govern is to populate. Well, they, they hate science and the history of the whole royal society, right? The British royal society is they pretend to promote science. Uh, if discoveries are made, they try to pretend they discovered them, but mainly they try to sabotage them. Uh, the, the, the other thing is uh, this mentality, uh, and we mentioned Theodore Roosevelt. If you look at the American West, right, you fly out here, right, you look, you look at some of these states, the... the the ending of the frontier, right, the, the passing of the frontier between 1890 and 1900 in, in America is not, it's, it's, it's premature in the sense that we have a lot of states out here, right, Wyoming, Utah, right, they're basically empty. And the reason that they're empty is that the, the, the process of, of settlement and population growth was artificially stopped by people around Theodore Roosevelt. The first concentration camps of the 21st, uh, the 20th century, uh, uh, death camps back in this Boer War period, right? The British putting these Dutch in concentration camps, and you go to them and say, "What? What sense does this make?" Right? You you claim to be a race theorist, but you're putting these Dutch in a concentration camp here in the middle of Africa. What sense does it make? In other words, it's a fraud. <laughs> in other words, it's it's ultimately only designed to serve imperial power. What they were concerned about in the case of the United States, the Homestead Act is one of the greatest land reforms in human history, right? The idea that you got this immense expanse and you're going to make that into family farms. And the, the British and the oligarchs say, no, we don't want that because such people are going to be independent minded.